A hundred years later, by the time of Ramses VI, Egypt is crippled by weak rulers and civil unrest. Warriors from Nubia invade, and for the first time in its history, roles are reversed, and Egypt is conquered by its southern colony. It is 1150 BCE, and a familiar power is about to re-emerge, the gods' wives of Amu, but this time they are black women from Nubia. Before the new black pharaohs can continue their conquest of northern Egypt, they must secure the southern city of Thebes. To do it, the Nubian kings cunningly resurrect the position of God's wife. They bestow the title upon their daughters with the hope of expanding their own power. But over time, the daughters transform their religious power into political power and usurp the rule of the pharaohs. At the Medinet Habu burial complex in Thebes, Egyptologists are now revealing the extent of power wielded by the gods' wives. The most important of the gods' wives are buried here at Medinet Habu. These were very, very powerful women who represented both political and religious power. They ruled Egypt as kings. These women were from Nubia, from what is today Sudan. And under their rule, they reunified Egypt and ushered in a period of renaissance in arts and culture and politics that lasted for over 500 years. The location of the God's Wife chapels begins to indicate the power of these Nubian women. Across from an early monument constructed by Pharaoh Hatshepsut, and along the procession route to a temple built by Pharaoh Ramses III, the god's wife, Amenirdis, built her funerary chapel. But the true indicator of her power is in the chapel courtyard, where she is depicted in the ancient tradition of gods and kings. The fact that the gods' wives really ruled as kings is very evident in these scenes from their tomb chapel at Medinet Habu. Here we have Shep and Wepet, one of the gods' wives, before the gods, Re Harakti and Isis. And here it's very clear that she is the same height as these gods. And this is extraordinary because people who are not kings or queens will be shown shorter than the gods. Another symbol of the rulership of these women is here. Here is a representation of Amenirdis, another of the gods' wives. And on her forehead, she wears the, the snake. It's called the Uraeus. And this is a symbol of royalty. Another indication is that her name, Amenirdis, is here encircled in a cartouche in an oval. And this is, again, a prerogative of kings and queens. The gods' wives are frequently depicted wearing the double feather crown a royal headdress that symbolized authority over the two kingdoms of Egypt. Inside Amenirdis' temple, Teter discovers further evidence of the gods' wives' kingly power. Here, Amenirdis presents offerings directly to Amu. It's an honor reserved for only a king. And in two similar scenes, Amenirdis offers sacrificial bulls to a statue of Amun, while devotees of Amenirdis offer sacrificial bowls to a statue of the god's wife. The iconography suggests the status of the god's wives is equal to the gods. From 1150 to 525 BCE, the god's wives were among the most powerful rulers on earth. But unlike God's wives of the past, God's wives from this period may have been celibate. Egyptologists point to the fact that the reigning God's wife passes on her title to an adopted daughter. Descriptions of the adoption ceremony survive. The God's wives and her attendants go to the temple of Amun with offerings. There, her attendants tie amulets and adornments on her. She is anointed with oils. The two-feathered crown of Egypt is placed on her head, 
and she is proclaimed God's wife, hand of God. With this ritual, the adopted daughter completes her transformation to God's wife.